So welcome back to my channel for data, machine learning, and tech career. In today's video, I'm going to go over you know, how I prepare my data for a logistic regression binary classification problem. And a lot of these scripts I use for with sklearn or pandas package are very commonly used across a lot of my machine learning models. So hopefully it'll be helpful for you guys. So whenever I prepare my data, I always, you know, run my query and then create a data frame based on the queries that I, I wrote and I created. But then, you know, I have to check, check the columns to make sure that all the columns that I selected in my select statement is actually included in my data frame and also to make sure that I am aware of what my column names are when I try to manipulate my data. So the first thing I do is to do df.columns to check what my column names are. But for some reason, whenever I do, I run my Hive queries that my data frame columns always print out as table name dot my column name. So it'll be like user ID or product ID, but always has a table name in front of it and then with a dot. So well, the first thing I do and whenever I run any of uh, the machine learning models is that I do rename my columns to just the actual column names. I'm removing the table name and a dot pretty much. So here I can do that by df.columns. So I'm selecting, I'm renaming all the columns that's available in the data frame equals df.columns. Uh, STRs here stands for string and I'm splitting the string based on a dot. So it's gonna take this string of the column name and then pretty much look, look at it as like the table name as the first part and the user ID as the second part. And then because now we have to uh, I have two parts. Now I'm gonna do dot string bracket negative one. So negative one is because I'm looking at the last string that I have uh, since I'm splitting them up, right? And then the reason why I do negative one is because in case that there are other you know uh, weird strings in my column name that I just want the last part to be my actual column name, which is why I'm doing negative one here. Uh, and then you do dot uh, string dot strip parentheses. So the strip parentheses is pretty much removing all the extra spaces and blanks that you have in your table or column name so that they will actually be, you know, nice and um, cleaned up column names that you need. So after we have our column names cleared up that we don't have to type in the very, very long uh, column name that we have anymore, then now I'm gonna, you know, since I'm doing a logistic regression for binary classification, then I'm gonna look, make sure that certain metrics across the two different groups of classification are very similar so then that we're, we're not introducing bias to the model that we're building. And so I often do that by uh, plotting a histogram to just look at the distribution uh, quickly. And I do that by df bracket uh, uh, quotation mark column name dot plot dot hist. His stands for histogram here, and then you can define your number of bins that you want. Uh, if you don't do uh, define your number of bins, the default is actually a lot uh, smaller number of bins, like 10 or something. So it's actually really hard to see a distribution if you don't uh, classify what, what number of bins that you want. And in this case, I'm using 100 so that I can you know, kind of see a distribution a, a little bit. So because I create, uh, I sample two different data frames based on a two different classification I'm trying to do, so then it's actually uh, very common for me to have to you know, combine the two data frames together uh, with the two different classifications. So I do that by, you know, defining my frames as my two different data frames, like df uh, underscore a and df underscore b, and then put them in brackets, and then I concat them uh, based on these two data frames. So in many machine learning model that, uh, you know, when it comes to categorical data, the model doesn't really know what is apples and oranges. So the best way to, you know, make sense of your different categorical data is to encode it with some numerical value, some kind of some sort of kind of like ID, right? Like you're associating ID with your categorical data. So in this case, apples will be one, oranges will be two. And so all the apples should be one. And that's how you would encode your categorical data. And you can do that by um, df.lock brackets df uh, your column so your column here will be feature a that you're trying to uh, you know 
reassign the categorical data to a different value, and then your string uh, equals equals your string, which is your apple in this case, and then the column name again, which is your feature A, and then make it into one. So in this case, we'll have feature A apple uh, re change it to one. And then the second one would be, you know, oranges and feature A column uh, equals two. So what I shared with you earlier is, you know, simple and easy when you just have one or two categorical data that you have to do labeling yourself manually, then that's great. But then when it comes to, you know, having so much categorical data and you're trying to relabel each one of them, then it's going to be a disaster. So luckily we have, you know, packages like sklearn, a uh, pre-processing package that can help us do this more easily by doing, you know, the one hot encoder and label encoder. So you can do that by, you know, first uh, naming the label encoder uh, function as a column LE and then you do a fit transform of the actual column name that you're trying to transform uh, and then we'll call that column labels and then so you know you want to keep your original column name in your data frame but then you want to add additional column name labeled uh, into your data frame so that you can kind of see them side by side and to make sure that it was working uh, you know properly and then so you would do that by uh, having df brackets column name label uh, equals your column labels which is uh, your transformed uh, you know column based on your existing column name. So before I jumping into checking a correlation between your features uh, please make sure you subscribe to learn more about data machine learning and tech career and also make sure you leave a comment below for you know what kind of machine learning project you're interested in so then maybe I can cover those for you in my videos and uh, make sure if you think this video is very helpful and useful please make sure you like this video uh, or give me more feedback in a comment if you have any feedback for me. So since the example I'm giving is logic regression, uh, correlation actually plays a huge role in the logic regression and I'm sure a, a lot many other uh, machine learning models also uh, has you know doesn't like highly correlated features uh, depending on what you're using but uh, I like to check my correlation to make sure that uh, my logistic regression model is not all, you know, with all these features that are highly correlated, that's really gonna uh, make my model not great. So I, I do that by, you know, having my data frame df dot uh, core uh, parentheses. So that's your correlation function. And that's gonna spit out a table like this, which is gonna give you, you know, correlation between A, B, and C uh, features and you can see that a diagonal is always one because the correlation between your you and yourself will always be one um, and but then you know when you have if you have a lot of features like 40 features or something it's really hard to see that in your table uh, because there's just too many features and numbers so because the correlation table with a lot of features is so hard to see that I like to uh, make my features into like a heat map so I can see better of like which you know which features are highly correlated based on the number of like based on the like the fifth feature like the ninth feature so I do that by plt dot uh, uh, match show uh, parentheses df dot core correlation function and then do plt dot show so that your uh, that's to show your plot and so uh, in this case, you can see that diagonal is all ones and that there because correlation of yourself is all, you know, ones. And then you can see that the brighter color means there are more highly correlated so that you want to look at this heat map and then go back to your correlation table to look at, you know, what which features are these that are brighter colors in your heat map. So after you have checked your correlation, you might find out that uh, you know some of these features are really super highly correlated and you should not include both of them. So then that uh, you want to drop some columns. Uh, the general rule of thumb is that you know having a correlation of 0.3 or above uh, seems a little high, then you might need to consider dropping these uh, features. But in this case, just give me an example like, oh, I see that feature A is super highly correlated with feature B, so I decided to drop feature A. And I would do that by doing, you know, creating a new data frame called df underscore new equals um, df dot drop 
uh, parentheses and then bracket your feature, uh, your column name. So in this case, I'm dropping feature A, uh, but you can always drop more features if you want by you know adding a comma and then more features and a quotation mark. And in that way, I, you can drop all the columns that you don't want anymore because of uh, how highly correlated they are. So dropping columns is useful when you only have to drop a few columns, right? But what if you run into a correlation heat map and then it looks like everything is highly correlated? Well, first of all, you should probably, uh, you know, create some new features instead uh, because all your features are highly correlated. But you can also, you know, make sure that you own, you pick the columns first that are, that are not highly correlated. And so in this case, it's just, you know, give an example that maybe feature A is the only one that's not highly correlated with everything else and you think that feature a will be a good example to build to be including your model then uh, instead of dropping both feature b and feature c then in this case i'm just gonna do you know including feature a um, so I do that by df underscore new, which is creating a new data frame, equals df uh, double brackets, and I add a quotation mark of my column uh, name feature A. Then you can do that by also adding more features that you actually need. In so in your data frame, you're going to see uh, your, you know, your data frame has NAs, which is blank but that it might not make sense to remain an A because like it actually means zero dollar revenue and you want to make sure your your, um, your data frame captures that. So you can do that uh, replacing your NAs with zero by df dot fill na um, parentheses zero. So now assume that you have your data set or data frame all cleaned up and you know ready to go and you're ready to build your model, then you will likely to have to split uh, your training data set and test data sets. And I mean, there's no rule of thumb like, oh, you have to use 80% 80 per, 80 training and 20% tests or 90% training or 10% tests. Uh, it kind of really all depends on you and this, the data. So just you know, for this example that I'm giving you as a 90% training data set and a 10% as test uh, data frame, then you can use sklearn uh, model selection uh, package and import your train test split. And you can do that by, you know, imagine you have your Y as your predictor and your X as all the other features that you have. You can do X underscore train, X underscore test, and your Y, which is your predictor, underscore train and test. And then do a train test splits of your X and Y and then do a test size. So in this case, test size is 10%, uh, so I do 0.1. And if you want to do 20% and you do test size equals 0.2 and then random state uh, equals 27. So you don't necessarily have to use a random state. Uh, it's just that when you include a random state that your uh, train and test split is going to be consistent. So it's always going to use the, 20, the random state of 27. If you don't specifically say 27 or any, and actually I think it can be like any number from one to a hundred or something. Uh, so then that you, you know, if you don't specifically say, then every time you run this uh, train test split, it will just going to give you a different result. So it depends on you know how how random do you want it to be because sometimes you want to make sure that they're not always uh, split so randomly that your test uh, your result going to always change that you want to make it consistent every time you run your data then you will have to specifically say a random state you how you want so quickly cover what i talked about today i first uh because my column name is always uh, very long uh, because of my how my query runs so I always have to rename my columns only uh, not include a table name I did that and I showed you guys how to you know look at a histogram of like looking at how quickly of like the high level distribution of your specific metric to make sure that uh, your two groups are very you know similar and there's no bias and then I also showed you how to combine your data frames if you have you know two different groups that you're selecting from and you want to combine them and then also encoding your categorical data uh, with a manual way and also with a package that will make a life a lot easier and then checking your correlation uh, using a table format and also a heat map and then also you know dropping columns or picking columns based on your correlation output and also your um, you know your NAs uh, filling them with zero or not uh, because um, in a lot of cases that uh, your NAs are actually just to be zero 
And then last step is that you do a train and test split. Split up your uh, data set into 90% training and 10% test, uh, depending on how you set it up.